Mr Crispin here once again and welcome to another Roll Top Chat, uh, the second in my series. Uh, three things today. One, I have a few questions for any Bridgeport experts out there. Uh, two, I have the answer to my mystery item from the previous video. And three, I've got another design of expanding mandrill. Uh, for anyone who doesn't know or hasn't seen my machining videos, I have a Bridgeport M head. I believe it's around a 1930s uh, model, um, a pretty old one. It does pretty well everything I need it to, although I am a bit limited when it comes to tooling and um, in general I feel the head is a bit out of proportion to the rest of the machine. The rest of the machine on the M head bridge port's not that dissimilar to the J head bridge port which is the one everyone will be familiar with, the full size bridge port so to speak. Uh, but on the M head bridge port, the, the actual head is quite lightweight and in my case it has a number 2 Morse taper in the spindle. So any tooling, whether it be a face mill or collets or uh, chucks, has all got to be a number 2 Morse taper, which is a bit limiting when it comes to milling. Um, on top of this, my uh, spindle had been modified by a previous owner. When it was originally made it was a brown and sharp number 7 and uh, it was then modified to a number 2 Morse taper. That modification has now um, failed so to speak and uh, the actual spindle taper has developed a little split. Here is my M head and um, as far as the orientation of this it goes uh, some people have it vertical so that the head can swing uh, in and out. I've got it horizontal just so it's a bit more rigid when you're knocking on draw bars and things but either way works. Um, so if I was going to mount a J head on here um, with the aid of my cardboard model I would attach the plate uh, thing that I'm going to make like that and then the J head would sit on this plate and that's about the diameter that I'd be looking at. So it's not a, it's a few inches bigger but it's not hugely bigger. To stop it swivelling I can either replicate the pin, I don't think there's a pin in there, or um, I could make the back of it square and a nice fit up against there so it's more or less wedged. Um, I'm not too worried about allowing it to nod. Um, I've never had to make the head nod for any job I've ever done on any bridge port. I'm sure as soon as I remove the ability to, I'll need to, but um, there's other ways of achieving those kinds of angles, so I'm not too worried about the nod, I'd rather have the rigidity in uh, this uh, axis. In terms of actually mounting it, I think I'd do away with the nice T-slot system that's in here. For anyone that isn't familiar, inside this uh, part there is a circular T-slot that allows you to turn this head. But because I've got the ram here, I can turn it anyway. So I'm not bothered about being able to do, do that with the protractor there, because I have a protractor on here. So really I'm not losing anything by um, doing away with that T-slot system. Instead I plan to just put tapped holes straight into this disc. There's four tapped holes and... Um, I'm pretty certain that'll do the job. So just to clarify before I go back inside I'd make a bracket like this out of three bits of one inch plate. It would slide on there um, the bolt would retain it. I'd come up with some system to stop it sliding from side to side or pivoting. Uh, the J head would fix straight on there with no ability to rotate it opposed to this the whole lot would rotate using the hand wheel over here um, and that boss would locate the J head. Um, that's pretty much all there is to it. So for anyone who isn't familiar this is the recess on the back of the J head and I'm hoping to utilize that internal bore. I'm certain there's enough strength here to um, take it. Yesterday I actually um, climbed up onto this end and I put a knee on each side of here. I mean uh, not a milling knee, uh, an, an actual knee. I knelt up on here and I 
joggled around a bit and I, I felt very stable up there and I'm sure I weigh much more than a J head does. Uh, and in the end Bridgeport did make the round ram with a J head. Um, so let me know what you think if you're a Bridgeport expert or an uh, engineer with some uh, helpful advice. Um, I think I'm going to go ahead with it as uh, proposed unless I hear any better suggestions. So um, back to the roll top. So second up, the mystery item. And uh, I had quite a few guesses. I'm impressed with the number of guesses I got, a lot of which were along the same lines. Um, I'll zoom in here for anyone who isn't familiar. But basically we have a uh, cone here with spiralling lines on it. So those are uh, quite a shallow uh, curve and they spiral right round and we have lots of little numbers. And before I just showed you uh, this view showing the numbers uh, and there's various scales on it. And there were suggestions such as a string winding device, an o-ring measurement tool, a former of some kind for shaping things. And anyone really who guessed uh, measuring equipment is on a right line of some description. There was actually one right answer in the comments and one answer that was nearly right. Uh, and I will now reveal the true identity of this piece. And if you can read that, it says own range scale. And this uh, belongs to a 25 pounder artillery gun as used by the British Army in the Second World War. And this would sit horizontally with the barrel and sighting arrangement going forwards. And then through a series of scales, this would be used uh, and rotating for different distances and different charges um, to adjust the elevation of the barrel. Uh, it is a casting, a cast cone, so uh, there's a, a machined um, diameter here and then it goes into the casting. Quite a nice piece, I would be interested to know how it's made. And so to have a look at what's actually on here, we have the main dials which go all the way around here as you can see and that would be used for all the long range work. Um, there are however some smaller scales on here for anti-tank usage and closer up stuff. So here we have a little scale for high explosive supercharge 17,000 feet a second and then we have uh, high explosive squash head 1850 feet a second and then we've got a monster down here uh, which is a 20 pound shell which is a armor piercing super plus I believe and that's a particularly powerful anti-tank weapon carrier dial sight as you can see and we've got ROFW Royal Ordnance Factory Woolwich uh, 1956. So that's uh, Royal Ordnance Factories is where all the armaments and things of that nature were made in England. But anyway, that came from my granddad who spent 41 years in the army um, keeping these things in order and maintaining artillery guns. And he came by these when Britain joined the UN and we changed all our sighting systems from Imperial to Metric. and. Um, of course all the uh, range cones were scrapped so he kept hold of a few um, and turned them into lamps. So that's what they are, hopefully I can get them going as lamps now. I just need to nip to a furniture shop and ask for a lamp shade to fit a 25 pound range cone. So the final bit tonight is to show another design of expanding mandrill which I uh, have been shown and I think it's slightly better than the one I showed in the last video so I'll quickly show that and uh, then we're done. So this is probably what's considered the traditional expanding mandrill. There's a chucking diameter here and this diameter is what fits into the bore of the work. Um, the principle behind it is this taper at the front. So using a tapered screw or something like that. Uh, when As this is wound in it wedges uh, this 
open and uh, hopefully causes a good amount of contact along the whole bore. Um, there's generally a number of slits in it to allow it to expand and uh, this could be any number, I've drawn three here quite often you just see one slit through the middle um, I've seen a few with three when this type of mandrel was first explained to me I was told that it's crucial to have the same amount of metal in each segment so that when the screw is driven in it expands evenly and maintains concentricity whether or not um, that's 100% true I don't know if you had a 10mm hole and a 10mm um, mandrel diameter I'm not sure whether it would wander off or not just based on the amount of metal in each segment uh, but I suppose the safe, safe way of doing it is to stick with an even um, amount however that probably means using a slitting saw or some accurate method of dividing it up rather than a hacksaw straight through the middle um, so if I was going to make one of these I'd probably get a, a piece of bar uh, centre drill, drill and tap the centre drill of course can be used to give this cone um, and then I'd probably take it away and put the slits in it then put it back in the lathe and turn it and leave it in the chuck until all the work's done to maintain concentricity um, one slightly quicker uh, method that Paul Compton mentioned in an earlier uh, video of mine was um, if you didn't want to go to the trouble of making one of these uh, tapered ends screws what you could do it would be to simply drill and then tap with the first tap in a set the taper tap if you like so that you've got a number of threads and then it tapers off then as you just drove a normal cap head in when it got to here say it would expand the mandrel anyway so there's just a couple of ideas on uh, another type of expanding mandrel probably a better one than I showed before as more of the work is in contact with the bore due to um, a much bigger area expanding rather than just the plugs I showed so there's a few more bits of information for you um, I wonder if anyone recognises this now they know what it is, I'd be interested to hear if you do. Um, other than that, uh, thanks for watching and see you on the next video.